So I'm on the Harlem Renaissance uh, Spotify, guys. So yeah. Well, he'll probably come across. I'll leave it running. Okay. Okay. Hi. Do I want the small book? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Does it work? Can you put stuff in it? Oh, I think you could. Is it head? Uh, we got. We're gonna finish this section. We got a whole other section of notes to do. Yeah. I like it. Okay. Okay. All right. So, how many of you guys watch the 1920 century video? Oh yeah. All right, guys. You watch that. Okay. It is a good video for a history video, for a class video. One of the ladies uh, yes. did this. It's very well done. I remember the pilot guy. So these are uh, these are notes we left off with last week, right? And I didn't really get through all of this, but um, guys, this this statement on Americans spent more on education around the rest of the world combined in 1929. Uh, if you look at the university system, obviously we have public school, you know, you know, basically K through 12 in this country, and then you look at the university and college system in this country, it's massive, okay? And so if you combine all the spending on education, more, and more was spent in America than the rest of the world combined on education, okay? Uh, which, you know, guys, is really going to help propel us forward as a nation. Um, this stuff about life expectancy and these diseases brought under control. Measles, guys, is something that's been in the news a little bit recently um, because, you know, some people are not vaccinating their kids. And so when you don't do that, you can get some outbreaks of the measles. Like you can see from the, this is a measles graph here. OK, so um, they came up with the vaccination for the measles in 1963. 64, 63, and you can see how the numbers of measles cases dropped in this country. But just recently, like there was an outbreak at Disney World a couple of years ago uh, at a cheerleading, uh, the big cheerleading convention in Dallas, there was a measles outbreak. Um, but I can pretty much guarantee there's only been one person in this room that's had the measles. Yeah. Okay. Have, have any of you had the chicken pox? You had the chicken pox? Right. Um, this is something that earlier generations had to go through. You know what I mean? Um, and people would have literally like chicken pox parties. So like one kid would get it, and then the other families that knew that kid would all get their kid to go get it from that kid. Because chicken pox is something you want as a child. You don't want as an adult. Okay, because it can have harmful effects as an adult. Okay, uh, but now with the vaccine, you know, you guys think about pox. The worst pox, the smallpox. You know what I mean? And that is just it's scary. It's scary the smallpox. Okay, um, it killed. I mean, it, there's a good chance. I mean, you had a good chance of dying if you got smallpox. Uh, yeah. The severity of the smallpox, well, with chickenpox, you just get the little, like, red sores, right? With chickenpox, there tended to be a lot of uh, pus, is that what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And the, fe the fevers generally would get you, right? So, like, with the measles, it could kill you because of the fever. Uh, now, the measles is kind of like chickenpox on steroids. Um, it, it's heavy and usually accompanied with a fever. Chickenpox, you get a fever, but you know, it's not generally didn't kill people. You know what I mean? Um, so it's just a, it's a, it's a lighter version. Uh, but smallpox was, um, was a killer big time. Um, and you know, when they started, you know, you know, when we do vaccinations, generally you're putting a small amount of the virus or the bacteria or whatever in your body. And um, 
And back when they did start to doing this, um, so they're taking pus from an active smallpox person, basically cutting your arm open and putting the pus in your arm. And some people would contract a mild case of it and so forth. And some people would get full blown chicken pox and taking, you know, the vaccine at the time um, could kill you. You know what I mean? Um, have I have I talked about the uh, the coronavirus vaccine? Have we talked about that? Um, if you don't know this, this is really interesting, and you can educate other people on this. Um, my next door neighbor's a pediatrician, so he explained this to me. And you guys know about this this. Um, you guys know what messenger RNA is. You took science, right? So uh, basically, they are not putting the virus in you with the COVID vaccine. The virus is not going in your body. They are creating, uh, they are tricking your body into creating a protein that mimics the coronavirus. Okay, so your body starts building antibodies against this protein, okay, which mimics the virus. It is not the virus. Okay, and so when you come in contact with the coronavirus, you've already built up those antibodies to that. Okay, because it, you know, because you have, it's crazy good science. You know what I mean? So, I mean, guys, personally, I've never taken the flu vaccine, um, but I'm not afraid to take this vaccine. Okay, you guys know me. I mean, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a skeptic about a lot of things, right? But um, I'm not afraid to take this vaccine. And I know a lot of people are. I was talking to somebody in the teacher's lounge this morning and they're like yeah i'm gonna wait for people to start taking you know growing third arms and legs and you know yeah i'm not taking that damn thing you know now the fact that it happened so fast you know they did this in 10 months is you know it's a little disheartening maybe but um i think based on um the people that have had it so far uh we had kinsey guy had it uh she had her first um Dose uh, said she had some soreness in her arm, um, which is typical for a vaccine. Okay. Yeah, but not because she had it. She had a close contact. No, she had the vaccine, but she had close contact. She had the first. You got to take two. two and so. Okay. So anyhow, uh, guys, we're going to see great improvements in life. And as I said, guys, we're going to have. Not only we're we gonna be healthier, we're gonna live longer, we're gonna have discretionary income, and we're gonna have time off. We're gonna have you know leisure time, which means we have entertainment. Okay. Now this is this is dated 1995. I should probably do an update on this. But this shows just I thought it was interesting looking at life expectancy uh, by country. Uh, this has probably changed some, but probably not too much. Uh, and a lot of this, guys, is based on diet, right? I mean, um, now, DNA also has a lot to do with your health and how long you're going to live is, is what your DNA, right? So, like, if your grandparents and your parents live really long, there's a good chance you're going to live a long life as well, okay? My mom had a heart attack at 53 and died. My dad died at 72. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be around. My grandpa lived pretty old. My grandma lived older than him, so, you know, part of that was probably diet for my parents, diet and alcohol and tobacco <laughs> for my parents, okay? Um, but they had both got rare diseases, which rare diseases are rare, so hopefully I don't get a rare disease, um, but both of those contributed to them, them passing on, okay? So, um, yeah, women, as we can see, do live longer than men, yes? Uh, and diet uh, certainly plays a role. Okay, what do they eat in Japan? What are, what's the magic pill there? What do they eat? Rice. Rice. <laughs> fish. Fish. Yes. Fish. What is the France? What do they drink? Red wine. Is red wine good for you? Yes. In moderation, red wine is good for you. It's good for your heart, right? Keeps those veins flowing. Yes. 
why there are more countries. Uh, just so you could fit the U.S. in here, I think. Well, it's just because you wanted to fit the United States in here. So you had to go more countries to fit the United States in here. Uh, yeah. You're yeah. like, why did they just add random countries? I know. Uh, because so uh, these other countries don't care about women. They don't have stats on them. Look at Ireland. They came from below to be right above. Actually, they're the same. I yeah. love them. Okay. And we talked I about these Ireland. things. Okay. So, moving on. Okay, so the Roaring Twenties, as we are listening to right now, okay, um, obviously in an age of prohibition, and so you've probably heard of these things before, speakeasies were illegal bars. Um, gosh, should I tell you this? Yeah, it's story time. Like your yeah, yeah, yeah. I, won't name, I won't name the speakeasy, but um, <laughs> during the pandemic, during the shutdown, okay, I had a buddy that he's single and he goes out and there's this it's, a, it's an irish bar and grill or pub okay no 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 and um during um the, the lockdown when all the bars were closed okay um this place or uh sold food too they sold pizza and so forth and um, for the regulars that used to come to the bar, after about, you know, two months of this, you could go in and order pizza and slide back in, there's doors, go back into the bar. And there were, and I went with my buddy one time. And <laughs> we, you know, drank some beers, you know, on tap, you know, just went to the bar and had our pizza. And there was only like five people. You know what I mean? And it was, we were breaking, they were breaking the law. We were breaking the law. It was a speakeasy. Okay, so we started talking about the speakeasy. Okay. okay. So maybe I shouldn't have told you that. But. No, now we know where to go. No, you don't know where to go. I didn't give you the name. You haven't been there. Yeah, you had to be a regular. Okay. And so, I mean, these businesses, as you guys know, they were really hurting. You know what I mean? And so, uh, in a sense, we were trying to help these people stay open by giving them some business, okay? Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was, it was like, it was cool. All right. Uh, all right. And I remember that day because uh, we took a selfie and sent it to our friends, and, uh, and I looked really fat. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was like, I was pushing 230 pounds. My face just looked. This that day, like, that day forward, I started losing weight. This is only a couple months ago. How did you lose weight? Uh, I've you lost know. almost, almost 30 pounds. Yeah. Walking. I just started walking. Walk, 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 walk. Okay. All right, too many stories. Okay, flappers. Okay, young women with short hair and short skirts. Okay, let me read this to you. Remember I had this old textbook, textbook for Sacco and Vanzetti? Okay. All right. This sets the tone if the music does it. Okay, you ready? In the 1920s, the sound of radios and phonographs began to fill the air. For the first time, motion pictures opened fantastic vistas for the millions. Americans started their love affair with the automobile. Women's skirts, which had been once thought dangerously high when they revealed a glimpse of the ankle, suddenly <laughs> shot up to the knee. Long hair which had been called a woman's crowning glory. Now, respectable women cut their hair in a short, boyish bob and actually wore lipstick. I know, the nerve. Some women even smoked cigarettes in public. The, yes. At the same time, there were still many old-fashioned Americans 
They were shocked by what they saw. Women, they said, ought to be put on a pedestal where they had neither the freedom nor the temptations of the rest of the human race. In this and other ways, the 20s was an age of conflict, confusion, excitement, and experiment. <laughs> Never was the nation more American. This was still the new world where people might try anything at least once. Okay? I love the way they wrote that. Was the night uh, before Christmas? And yes. All the ladies were North Carolina. <laughs> yes. Not all of them, but yeah. Um, so yeah, some people were shocked by this, uh, and then the music, right, and the dances, and you know, that's why you need to watch this video, I sent you, okay, it's, it, it shows a lot of this, and so forth, and then, like I said, with the, with the, with the time on their hands and extra money, they're going to be entertained, and sports, you guys know, is a huge thing in this country, this is really the heyday, okay, of where sports really take off in this country, and so, boxing, golf, um, baseball, they called the national pastime. This 1927 Yankees, because of their unmatchable batting power, became known as Murderer's Row, often direct, uh, delivering their fatal blows in the late innings as 5 o'clock lightning because ball games started at 3.30 in those days and were usually over by 6 o'clock before it got dark because there were no lights, right? Um so when you look at old footage of baseball games, people are dressed nice. You know what I mean? They're, they're coming from work. They're wearing suits and ties. Women are wearing dresses and the big hats and so forth. Any of you guys ever been to a Royals game in the middle of the summer? It's hot. You know what I mean? You get that swamp ass going on, you know, sitting in the tree. Please. You know what I'm talking about. Can you imagine guys wearing a suit to a game in the middle of August? Now, ladies, you get to wear a dress which is a little nice or, you know, a little bit more breathing going on there. But, um, guys, the 27 Yankees, you didn't want to face that lineup if you were a pitcher, okay? I mean, you got Babe Ruth. This is Lou Gehrig, okay? And Lou Gehrig is one of the greats. Um, that 2017 may have been the best ever. Um, golf was big. There's there's some really good movies on this. Uh, any of you guys ever seen The Greatest Game Ever Played? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about The Legend of Bagger Vance? All of them. They're all good. Yes, games. yes. And they, kind of, they show this era of the 19, yeah. early 1900s golf in America. And guys, huge crowds. I mean, well, my favorite sporting event of the year, I love the World Series. I love the Super Bowl. I love... March Madness, right? Everybody. The Masters. So cool. The Masters is the best sporting event of the year for you. What is interesting about watching The Masters is probably the coolest thing you've ever seen. There's golfers, all the best golfers, they come to the Masters. It's the most beautiful course in the world. It is amazing. Yeah, it's people hitting the ball for a really long time. No, this is amazing. It's four days yes. of yeah. classic golf. Yeah. Best yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Boxing. Did any of you guys ever see the movie Cinderella Man? Did you watch that at all? Cinderella Man? Uh, I watched yeah. it. I guess you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This, and guys, uh, speaking of this movie, if, if you're looking for a good movie to watch, and I know, like, I'm, if you're Netflix people or Amazon Prime people, I'm, I'm hitting that spot where, like, I'm running out of stuff to watch. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to give you some stuff here. Okay, Cinderella Man is really good about the depression. Okay, it's one of the best movies that kind of shows you the plight of human beings during the depression. Um, and it's entertaining and it's about boxing as well. Okay, um, I'm a big boxing fan to this day. Uh, if there's good, I mean, it's an art. I know some people like people are bashing each other's faces in, but there's an art to it. Okay, and um, look at this here. Uh, Jack Dempsey fought former U.S. Marine Gene Tunney in Philadelphia, losing his title on points in front of 120,000 people. Okay, that's a massive crowd, all right? So you saw this all over the country. Uh, Notre Dame football. Yeah, the heyday. Uh, and the most famous wasn't a player. It was the coach of Notre Dame football, you know? His name was Newt Rockman. Or Canute Rockman. How many guys ever saw the movie Rudy? Oh. I can't think there's 
I don't watch are these sports movies? It's, 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 it's about somebody's life. It's not a football movie. It's about Rudy Rudiger. Well, have you ever seen A League of Their Own? Of course. I think I do. Which is a great World War II movie. I feel like we should okay. talk about more golf movies. I just ran across on Facebook, somebody posted some real color footage. It was only about 45 seconds long. Some real colored footage of women playing uh, baseball. It was awesome. Yeah, I reposted that. That's really good. I'm going to friend you. <laughs> when you graduate. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now, uh, and then there's this man. You've heard of Charles Lindbergh? Yeah, we have. And some of you have been to uh, the Smithsonian in Washington, and you'll see this plane hanging in the rafters, uh, the spirit of St. Louis, okay? He flies the first solo flight across the Atlantic, okay? This is 1927. When he does this, okay? What are we talking about? Okay, we'll talk about that. Listen. No, 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 no. I will. This is part of my regular curriculum, okay? You just got to give me a chance, okay? Now, Lindbergh, guys, this is an amazing feat. Now, if you were to go to sub-Saharan Africa or to... Uh, a, a city in China, or a city in India, or a city in Europe, or a city in America, and you wanted to find a name that was like a household name that everybody, whether it be in any of these places, and said, I've heard of this person. Who would that be today, besides Jesus Christ or Muhammad? I am <laughs> Besides a religious figure, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Back in the in the eighties, Justin Bieber. No, I don't know. Him. Back in the eighties, Michael Jackson. Oh yeah. And Michael Jordan. Uh, Another name is probably LeBron James. That is worldwide known, right? Okay. Gandhi. He's a religious figure. Oh. Mother Charles Lindbergh <laughs> becomes a household name worldwide. You understand? This is like the epitome of fame. What he accomplished. And he, I mean, everybody saw. Now, you guys remember that we were talking, I was using that word homogeny the other day, right? Okay, so everybody's hearing the same thing, okay? And so Lindbergh becomes this world famous figure. Uh, guys, it's hard. You've stayed up 24 hours before, right? No. Stayed up all night? No. no. I sleep that I don't care. Some of you have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Add, you know, yeah, nine more hours to that and nine and a half more hours by yourself in a plane. Now, the Spirit of St. Louis doesn't have a windshield. So the lookout's in front of the plane, you got to stick your head out the window. Okay? How did he fly? How did he see? By instruments. Okay, and he's flying most of this guy's open over open water, much of it at night, by yourself. This, you know, you guys like to sleep with like a fan going on in the background, some type of humming noise. Yeah, easy to fall asleep here. Okay, so he's drinking a bunch of coffee. Now they made a movie out of this called the Spirit of St. Louis, and um, what's his name uh, from It's a Wonderful Life? Uh, Jimmy Stewart plays Jimmy Stewart plays Lindbergh. And there's a part in this movie where this fly, like a house fly, flies into the cockpit. And it's like flying across the Atlantic with him. And he's having these long conversations with this fly. <laughs> it's helping him stay awake. Okay. But when he lands in Paris, he's met by a you know, mob of people. And then um, he actually sails back across the Atlantic. And they have this huge ticker tape parade. Uh, maybe the largest in American history for Lindbergh, okay, uh, in New York City, okay? Yes, later on we will talk about Lindbergh because he is somewhat of a German sympathizer on the eve of World War II, okay? So, and there's the whole thing with the Lindbergh baby, okay, where his child is uh, stolen. Yes, their child is stolen, Um from a second story window. Oh, yeah. okay. How did that happen? It's a, 
Well, they, they held him for ransom, the child, but they never got the baby back. No, they never got the baby back. How old would the baby be now? 80, 90, 100, I don't know. I can't believe that child. Okay, who's this? He looks like Henry. Henry Ford. Henry Ford. Okay. Now, we've talked about the automobile. Okay, the electric power factory, all the stuff coming off the assembly line, right? Um, radios, refrigerators, planes, all kinds of stuff. Okay. This is the, a picture of the assembly line here. So interchangeable parts in conjunction with the assembly line, they are going to go from the time to assemble a car, a Model T, went from 14 hours to 93 minutes as they perfected the system. Okay, By 1925, one car was rolling off the assembly line every 10 seconds. Now this, guys, in the factory, scientific management... Okay, uh, the author of this book, The Principles of Scientific Management, somebody you may have studied last year with Mr. Ferris, Frederick W. Taylor. Okay, this is the guy that found a better way to shovel coal. <laughs> coal in the factory. It's a more efficient way to power the plant. Okay. Um, so these principles of scientific management are still relative to today. I mean, when you're building something, you need to be the most efficient as you can so that you can make the most money that you can. Okay. The more efficient, the more money you make. Okay. Um, the more products you can produce and so forth. So Frederick W. Taylor's kind of a, a forebearer of that. Okay. Scientific management. There's all different, when, if any of you guys study business, you go to business school, there's all di different types of theories of how to best manage a corporation, a business. Um, there's marketing-based management like that Koch Industry uses. Uh, Charles Koch's written a couple books on management styles. And uh, one of the things they do over Koch Industries, for instance, um, if, if you work hard for the company and let's say you, you're in charge of a project, and you come in under budget, and everything works, you're helping the company make money. They share that revenue with you. You know what I mean? They, like, if you do something good for the company, they reward you for it. So, like, if you guys, like, kick butt in college and so forth, and they said, yeah, that's partially because of Mr. Ebright, we're going to pay Mr. Ebright more money. You know what I mean? That's It's, like, merit-based, okay, not... Yeah, you know, like if you work for the, if you're a teacher in the public school system, there's a pay scale. So if you're a new teacher, this is what you make. If you get a master's degree, you get this bump. It doesn't matter how good of a teacher you are, you just get paid based on that, that chart. Okay. In a merit-based system, you're rewarded for doing your job well. Okay. And it's tend to work pretty well for Coke Industries. And for my wife, because she does a good job, and they take care of it. Now, they expect a lot. I mean, there's, there's high expectations there. So she's, you know, she's accountable, kind of like you guys are here. All right, so we got all these new products, right? Now we got to start selling them, okay? So the advertising industry is going to just blow up, okay? Um, so back then... It's newspapers, magazines, billboards, direct mail, radio, those are all things we, we, we have as well today. Uh, now, obviously, today we've got a lot different advertising, more advertising, obviously television, right? But the Internet, right? They've gotten really sophisticated with this. Yeah. Sam. Oh, if you mark, you don't want them. Yeah, especially if I have them. You might go back. You turn on the other way. They still listen to you. They yes. Still get the yes. Yeah. Are they listening to me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On my phone. Yeah. I know Siri pops up every now and then. Um. 
But yeah, if you do a Google search for something, like um, this happened just like two years ago. I was uh, looking for a new green belt for my baseball uniform. because I wear like a nice leather one. And so I, I did a Google search for that. And then I, you know, opened uh, YouTube. Next thing I see ads for belts, green belts on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, they're it's very sophisticated. Now you may, in some cases, you might like that because you get some new options. It's kind of annoying when you, you know, I already bought the green belt. Leave me alone. You know what I mean? Um, I'm kind of in the market for a truck. Okay. And so I've been looking at trucks online and boy, I just get bombarded with advertising. Okay. Uh, so it went from a $1 billion industry before the war to a $3 billion industry by 1929. And if you look at advertising, especially like television advertising, they promise you, besides selling you the product, they're trying to sell you something along with it. And this is something you'll learn in business school. Uh, I have a marketing degree, so these are things you want to associate with your product are comfort, health, beauty, status. And then one I don't have up there is sex. You know, they say sex sells, right? Um, so whether it's, you know, mouthwash or Mercedes Benz, they're trying to sell you other things along with them. To make you feel like, hey, if I buy this, I'm going to have these other attributes, okay? Um, then this, guys, buy now, pay later. By 1928, Americans owed more than $1 billion on automobiles, okay? I can remember when I was growing up in the 70s. Um, most of your parents probably have credit cards, right? Okay. Uh, I have two in case one doesn't work. I have two credit cards. I have two Visa cards, right? My mom had a wallet full of credit cards. J.C. Penny card, Diners Club. I mean, every store that she ever shopped at, she had a card. Now, I, my wife has a Kohl's card because you get discounts with, if you use the Kohl's card. You know what I mean? But, I mean, she had a slew, Sears, all of them, okay? Montgomery Ward, all of them had different credit cards. And uh, buy now, pay later, Okay. And as I said before, this does get people in trouble, these credit cards, okay? Not just credit cards, but borrowing money. People get in trouble, okay? Uh, now, this is the last two lines of the notes for this chapter. We're going to go to 18 here in a second. Um, this is an important factor in the Depression, okay? One of the causes of the Depression. So during this decade, between 1918 and 1929, wages rose 26%. Sounds great, right? Wages up 26%. Product productivity rose 40%. So we were producing 40% more goods than we had previous to this, okay? Wages did not keep pace. So that when there was so much being produced, people didn't have enough money to buy all the stuff that was being produced. So let's say there's an abundance of sewing machines and toaster ovens, washing machines, vacuum cleaners. There's an abundance of inventory on these that have been produced. But there's people stop buying them because they've already owned one or they can't afford it one. And so what happens at the store is you get stuck with all this inventory. So you tell your representative, say, look, don't send me any more toasters. I got enough. Well, when everybody starts telling the manufacturer of toaster, don't send me any more toasters, what happens back at the factory where they're making toasters? They slow down, right? Or cut jobs or cut wages, which means there's going to be fewer people that can afford toasters. Following me? This is a downward spiral. This, this will start a downward spiral. That really starts in 1927. We start to see this become a problem. And slowly it'll get worse. Okay. So this is one of the causes that wages did not keep pace with productivity. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to get into, guys, is the stock market crash. We've gotten to 1929.
So actually, the test will be after we finish these notes. Okay. What do you want with them? So the homework I gave you, you don't need to use your book. Okay. Um, I'll look for a day to do that. Maybe Thursday and Friday I'll hand them out. How's that sound? If you want one. Okay, so we're going to be talking, and you guys are going to want to watch the video tomorrow, okay, because I'm going to go into some really good stuff on the stock market and investing and retirement planning. You're going to get some of that in this class, okay. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of this topic uh, to do some fun stuff with you, okay. All right, not, I mean, Educate you on some, on a few things. Okay, now the stock market itself, okay, is legalized gambling. Yes, what are you betting on in the stock market? Different companies, yes, and how well they will produce. Yeah, how well they will do. Okay, now these companies that are traded publicly on the stock market. They offer up shares of their company or ownership of their company to the end of, to the world so that they can raise revenue to expand their operations and grow. Okay. Um, by issuing stocks. Okay. Now, if you own your own business, okay, you will have shares of stock. So if you incorporate into a business, okay, and most businesses, like say you're starting a small business on your own, most people will set up what's called an S corporation, okay? An S corporation gives you limited liability. So if the business goes bankrupt, it doesn't affect your personal belongings, your house, your car, and so forth. So the business has liability, you don't as a person. Does that make sense? Okay, this protects you, okay? This is why most people set up S corporations, all right? And you can actually sign up to buy uh, shares, you know, create these shares of stock, and you will own 100% of those shares because you are the person that owns the business, okay? So you have an S corporation, right? Now, if you want to become a public business to sell your stocks to other people to buy ownership, if you give up 51% of your shares or sell those to other people, you no longer have the majority shares. So you don't get to make the decisions in the company any longer. So this is where they hire a board of directors and a CEO to run the company. So Mark Zuckerberg, created Facebook, right? Mark Zuckerberg still retains 51% of all the shares in that company. That means he has managing control over Facebook. Okay? If you give up, so like General Motors, which has been around for more than 100 years, it is a publicly traded company that has a board of directors and a CEO. Does that make sense? Henry Ford used to own Ford Motor Company. The Ford family does not own Ford Motor Company anymore. Okay? The people do. The people that own stock in it. Okay? So the decisions that the board of directors makes, and the CEO makes, and the CFO, and all these other people, the vice presidents and all that, that affects the, how well that company is going to do. Okay? And if that company does well, and I own shares in that company, I make money. I'm a partial owner of that business. Yes. They, it's probably in a trust or a will that it's going to go to another individual. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you want to get a will done and all that. The trust set up. Yeah. Um, so, Charles Koch is the sole owner 
of Koch Industries. It's the second largest privately owned company in the country. Cargill, you've all heard of, is the largest, I believe, privately owned company in, in the country. Okay. Look, look. Cargill? Cargill? It's Cargill. They, they do all kinds of stuff. Food products, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. What? Like a building downtown. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have a, they have a headquarters here. Um, yeah, Cargill's a huge privately owned company, so is Coke Industries. Okay. Most big companies today are publicly traded, and you and I can buy shares of those companies. Okay. Well, one thing I'm going to get to. What we got? Okay, we just got one thing I'm going to get to tomorrow. This is very important to you to understand this is if I own a share of stock, it's only worth what somebody else is willing to pay me for. You understand? So if I buy a stock for $40 and I try and sell it for $40 and nobody's willing to pay me $40 for it, then it's not worth $40. Now, I might get you to buy it for 38. If the company's doing well, I might be able to sell it for $50 a share over time. So I bought it at 40, the company's done well, it's grown, it's doing well, its future looks bright. And I say to you, hey, I've got this stock, I'll sell it to you for $50. And you're like, yeah, that's a good bet, I'm buying it, I just made $10. But if nobody's willing to buy it from me, then it's only worth the paper it's printed on. That's it. Yeah. They can buy back a majority of the shares, an individual thing. So, like, if you bought up 51% of General Motors, if you had enough money to do that, you could take control over that company. And the U.S. government did do that with General Motors back in 2009. $50 billion. They bought up a majority of General Motors stock with our tax dollars. To bail them out. We talked about that last semester at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get a lot done. But tomorrow, check out this, this talk on the stock market, okay? See you guys. Have a great day.